Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our very first Finding Fish excursion. Give me just a second to share my screen here, and I want to show you what all the cool things are that we are going to do today. Thank you for bearing with me on my minor technical difficulties. <laughs> Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. We are coming to you live from Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve in foggy Naples, Florida. And today I want to introduce what we're about to do. So I'm Sarah Falkowski and I'm the education coordinator. And we are in a webinar format. So that means that we are not able to see or hear you, but we know that you're out there and we know that you have questions. So you can use the chat box at the bottom, that's in the black toolbar at the bottom of your screen, and you can communicate with us if you're having trouble hearing or seeing, if you have a question about registration or any other sort of customer service type things, you can put it in the chat box. If you have a question for our speakers today, we want you to put it in the Q&A box. The questions will go in there and we will try to answer them throughout the presentation and at the question answer session at the end. Now, there are a lot of you joining us today, so we may not get to every question. So make it really good so that yours gets answered. And I want to introduce the rest of the team. So we are at an excursion. That means it's a live field trip from the field. And today's topic is called Finding Fish. So you are going to meet all of these educators and some surprise guests from the reserve today. 
Rookery Bay is part of a national network. We are located here on the western edge of the Everglades in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see that there are 29 sites like us throughout the country, including Alaska, Hawaii, and even Puerto Rico. We all focus on research, education, and stewardship. In Florida, we're also part of another network that helps to protect 4 million acres. We are part of the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, and you can see all the different sites throughout Florida that are different aquatic preserves and coral reef conservation programs, as well as the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary. So today we are streaming live from our 110,000 acres. So this star right here is the Environmental Learning Center. That's where we used to have field trips when the building was open. But now that we are all working in a remote capacity and you guys are possibly at home or working remotely as well, we are bringing the field to you. So today the field team left on Shell Island Road and they are out in this area somewhere. And so we're about to tune in and find out what kinds of fish they found. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues and we'll get started on the live part of the presentation. Helps if I unmute myself. So good morning, everyone. My name is Dita O'Boyle. I'm an education specialist here. And today we are participating in our Finding Fish excursion. So I'm just going to run through some terms that you're going to be hearing my coworkers using while they are out in the field because they have some very fun surprise guests that they're going to be talking about, animals that are native to our reserve, and they're going to be using some terminology when talking about their body shapes because even if you don't know what species of fish you're looking at, you can figure out about a little bit about how they live, where they live, and how they get their food or what they might eat just by looking at their bodies. So looking at this screen, um, this PDF shows some examples. They're going to be talking about the maybe the different shaped mouths, different shapes of their body. Are they very streamlined where they're um, kind of uh, laterally compressed? So think of like a butterfly fish. Are they flat like a flounder? What's their coloration? Do they um, live in uh, where there's a lot of algae or are they a schooling fish? And then maybe even some other specialized modifications to their body. And today what they did to collect their fish, there's a lot of different methods our reserve you can use to monitor fish populations. And they used a method called trawling. So, Trawling, you may have heard of. This is where if you like to eat uh, Florida pink shrimp or the Gulf shrimp, they do use a trawl net and fingers crossed. I won't have any audio on this. Let's see, come on up, there we go. This is a video of a trawl being deployed, not from our current location today, but actually during our fisheries monitoring program. So this is in Moraines Bay, but we use the same equipment. So we have a specialized boat that has the motor in the front so it doesn't interfere with the net. The net does have floats on the top and then on the bottom there are there's a little weight so it holds down and there's two wooden doors to push the net open so it opens up wide in the mouth. We have that buoy on the back so people can see where the net is. And then there's actually a big chain that hangs down on the bottom and that helps to kind of tickle up the animals and scare them into the net. Um, our researcher does trawl for 10 minutes. We do a shorter trawl because we do have a permit to conduct this. You do um, disrupt the bottom habitat a little bit, but this is a way to really look at what juvenile fish are in the area and also some of the more slow moving fish. So it does take a group to bring this net in. You have your boat captain, you have to have your net pullers, so they're bringing it in. Once they get towards the end, there is going to be a bag where all the fish get scooped into, and then you bring them up on your boat. All right, with that, I am going to turn it over to our field crews. You can see what they caught today. All right, can everyone hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome. Well, welcome to the first uh, of many Finding Fish excursions live from the field. You are joining the field team on our education vessel, Megalops. And we just pulled a trawl, like Dita was explaining. Check this out. We've got our gear. We had an amazing catch. We were able to bring everything on board, sort it out, and pick out the best organisms for you to see today. So I am joined by a handful of guests and staff 
that we are going to explore these animals with today. So my name is Morgan and I'll let our team introduce themselves. Good morning, my name is Julie and I am the water quality program manager here at Rookery Bay. And if I can get my camera, let's see. Hello, Woo. I'm Janine, I'm working the back and you'll hear me I'm on the education team here at Rookery Bay. All right, awesome. So like I said, we just worked up our net, we worked up our catch, it's right here in front of us. So we will waste no time and we're gonna explore some of the cool critters that we found. Let's do uh, it. Got my PPE on, that way we're ready to go nice and safe. Okay, so let's see what we can dig up here. We want a net? Yeah, maybe, all right. So let's... Uh, okay, nice and easy. Awesome, all right. Okay, so hopefully our camera will cooperate. How's our visuals, education team? Looks amazing. What Great. is that, Morgan? I'm so glad you asked. We are holding a gulf pipe fish. Check that out. This is one of three species that we could find in the reserve. The other two are the Florida pipe fish and the chain pipe fish. And we are able to tell that this is the gulf pipe fish because of that really short snout. And I'm trying to get it close enough to the camera for you all to see. And that, that one looks like it has an extra large like belly. What's going on with this pipe fish here? Absolutely. So this pipe fish, uh, we believe is brooding or holding eggs. And uh, it's really special because this particular fish is somewhat related to seahorses in that the males will carry the eggs in an external pouch. So that's why this one looks a little bit beefier uh, than you normally would see it. I think we got two today, right? We did, two of the same species. I'm gonna let them swim around a little bit. And what's neat about these fish is that they typically hang out in seagrass. So that long, odd looking body shape is perfect to blend right into those blades of seagrass. It's amazing. Awesome. All right. What does it eat? Oh, you know, it eats algae. It's, it's amazing. It, they've got this like suction like structure. I mean, you saw it snout, right? It's perfect, it's like a hose. Awesome. Awesome, nice. So plankton, algae, that is great. Yeah. So All right, who else do we have? Let's work up our next specimen here. So that would be like an odd shaped body, right? Definitely, yeah, that looks a little bit different than your average fish. And we are gonna see kind of one of the more common ones uh, right now. Let's see, maybe a net would work better for this. Yeah. Okay, so, and we all know fish are fast, so we're gonna do our best to uh, make this a quick capture. Of course, the, the fastest one we possibly have in the tank we're gonna talk about. This is real life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, so this is our, our next specimen here. And what is that? What is this called? This is called a mohara. A mohara. Common bait fish. Wow, just gave you all angles right now. <laughs> I see that has a nice silver coloration. Does that mean anything? It does. So given that this is a bait fish, uh, and you did mention its silver color, it is a schooling fish, a loose schooler. Uh, so it'll say power in numbers is usually the, the best way to put that. I also can tell it has a very large eye. It does, it does. And that is so helpful for this particular fish because it's able to kind of avoid predation a little bit better. Uh, and you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where it can find food better too. Cool, and it's making this really fun little um, mouth yeah. uh, movement. So could you tell us a little bit more about its mouth? Sure, so that's really important for this fish's feeding strategy. And it just wants to get out of our hands today. That's called a protrusible jaw. And it's basically like a sucker vac if, uh, for all my people with pet hair, you know. Oh, look at it, really showing it right now. I've used one of those before, but it'll use it to suck up little invertebrates uh, in our estuary here. And that really contributes to the greater uh, food web here in our estuary. It, it, it's amazing. And uh, really crucial. Are there more than one type of mohara? Yeah, definitely. So that's why in the field, it's really hard to ID fish uh, on the spot. Usually you have to take them back and really work them up, look at uh, their anatomical features, but there are a handful of species of mohara that we could find. So that's why we're keeping it general. 
Cool. And I think they tolerate a wide variety of salinity. I think they do. So Julie's going to tell us uh, what we're dealing with in terms of salinity in our estuary right now. Awesome. She's got some equipment here. So I've got a YSI data logger and um, on it, it's giving me some readings like temperature and salinity. So right now the salinity is 32.39 where we're at. So that's almost marine. So it's pretty salty, but that makes sense, Julie, because it's the dry season, right? Right. So right, right. let's awesome. drink more salty in our estuary. That's awesome. Do you want the temperature? Let's tell go. Us. Yeah, tell us. We need to know. Yeah, let's. <laughs> so right now the temperature is 24 degrees Celsius, which converts to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, our water's pretty warm right now. Awesome. Yeah, warm. Couple and days does temperature water. affect anything else in the water? Um, it can affect all kinds of species um, depend, you know, there are a lot of species that uh, need a warmer environment in order to um, propagate and, and, you know, just survive. So uh, I would say, yeah, temperature is one of the really important factors when, when species are deciding where they want to live. Yeah, if it gets too cold, we can lose some species, I think. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. All and right. That mohar is pretty cool because they can move really fast with that forked tail. So if conditions are not ideal, whoo, they're out of there. A little sprinter right See there. See you later. Yeah, they're so fast. They're first swimmers. The nice. forked tail is important. And they had the, we were looking at the body shape on the ID guide and yeah. they have that compressed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very uh, blunt body. <laughs> yes. But nice and flat, like together vertically. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we have another yeah. fish that we definitely want to well, show last off. But not least, this one's using uh, a lot of our structure. Yeah. They're, so they're kind of hiding. Okay, so let's see. This lightning whelk has definitely uh, worked his way into the corner here. <laughs> I, this is a strong one. We don't want to. <laughs> oh. All right. All right. Let's get a minute. So that's kind of indicative of where this fish lives. This fish that Morgan's kind of chasing is um looking for structure and maybe that's because of you know its habitat or maybe its size even looking for some shelter oh man all right now maybe i don't know you might have to take off your gloves because okay it's yeah. a little hard to see yeah let me help you out thank you teamwork makes the dream work here in uh Rickery bay all right oh my gosh this fish let's see all right, can oh, oh wow. there we go. So, so what are you holding here? This is a golf toad fish, and Janine, it's making a sound. Oh my gosh, what? So I know that fish do make sounds, whether it's like for mating reasons, mm -hmm. maybe defense, and they make it different ways. How does this particular fish make sound? So this particular fish is really interesting because it has uh, something called a swim bladder, which all fish do so that they don't sink. Uh, but it compresses the muscles around its swim bladder. And basically the noise it sounds like is when you're squeezing a balloon filled with air. Uh, oh, and that's, that's like, like yeah, really and, annoying. Yeah, yeah it's like the squeaky sound. So this fish, uh, that's what we're hearing on the field side here today. Uh, very, very cool. That is awesome. And they have pretty powerful jaws, right? Oh, the nickname for this fish, I hope you all know this, but if not, this is your new vocab word for the day. This toadfish is also called an oyster crusher. Uh, so that tells us a couple things. One, that's kind of where they like to hang out. That's a good habitat for them. Look at that coloration. Yeah, they're benthic really... fish, love to hang out on the bottom. But then it also tells us that their jaws are unbelievably powerful. And that's why I'm trying to keep my fingers away from it <laughs> uh, because if it can crush an oyster, it sure can crush my fingers. <laughs> so we're gonna be nice and kind to this uh, golf toad fish. And just thinking about that body shape again, you know, this one looks like it's tail shape. It's almost like all the fins are connected. So be like a continuous uh, tail. Yeah, a continuous. There's, no, there's no real start, but you definitely see the end. So it's, yeah. it's a nice flow. Continuous. Awesome. And um, we have, so I know we have uh, one of these in our uh, tank in our, our learning center, but it's yeah. bright orange. Oh, so yeah. I mean, what's up with that? You all saw in the audience just now that one was brown. It was almost speckled, very mottled coloration. Uh, depending on the species and where each individual lives, their color will vary. So this fish won't change color necessarily, but each individual fish, depending on where they live, can have a different coloration. 
you know, whether it's in a spongy habitat, because sponge can be all sorts of colors, oranges, yellows, that kind of thing, as well as tunicates. So this one in particular was probably hanging out by an oyster clump or maybe on the muddy bottom. So a lot of variation. Why, yeah. So that's why this one's brown. But the one in our tank at the learning center, it's bright orange. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, and that's just depending on where we picked it up. Cool. Well, that's awesome. So that's all we're showing for fish today, right? Because we got to save some for our next, uh, we have three more of these. Absolutely. So we have to keep you all interested and connected with us. So you'll see something different every time. That's what's so fun about doing these educational trolls. Awesome. Do you want to show them maybe an invert? Absolutely. We did, we did bring a couple invertebrates on board and I, I think you're dying to show oh, at yeah. least one. Listen, we've been doing <laughs> programs with our school students and I always get a, a rile out of this one. This one's my favorite. So check this out. I mean, I love holding it up to my head because you can see how big it is. Uh, this is a lightning whelk. This is, a, like Janine said, an invertebrate. This is a large marine snail. And if this is blowing your mind, well, I'm about to blow it even more. This snail can get actually twice as long as it is now. So almost two feet long in length. Unbelievable. Oh, and pushing out water. Wh um, what does this animal eat? So this animal is really awesome because it eats things like bivalves. So like think of oysters or clams or mussels. And it can do that because it's got this razor sharp edge. Oh, slime too. That's important. It's very important. But it's got this razor sharp edge that it can basically wedge in between the two shells of like a mussel per se and pry it open. And then it's a heyday, lunch for, for days. But yeah, this lightning wolf is so awesome. Uh, and actually this is the only left-handed shell in Florida. So fun fact, tell your friends. These are so awesome. And is that the biggest snail that we get here? I mean, that one's pretty big, but. Ooh, I would say this is like second best uh, when it comes to the big snails. The largest one that I've seen is a Florida horse conch and they are awesome. Those can get past two feet long Woo! and they're big. And they're, you know, they're predators too. So it's weird because snails not only eat bivalves, but they can eat each other. <laughs> oh man, I think there was another snail in there that you saw, right? Yeah. And that was definitely trying to move away from the lightning well. Absolutely. We'll just give you a visual for that because it's body, it's out, and it's so cool. Oh, cool. Check this out. This is a crown conch, and you're seeing its foot, or that bottom part of its soft body. And right now it's slowly closing up using that operculum as its trap door. And these crown conchs, we must have been trawling over some oysters because we got the oyster crusher, that toadfish, and this crown conch, very commonly seen on our oysters. Uh, because look at this. I mean, it almost looks like an oyster from a distance. The, the texture and the coloration is just spot on uh, to blend into that environment. So very, nice. very cool. And I think we have one more invertebrate that joined our party today, or that we kept. We yeah. had a lot of animals to choose from, but yeah, we kept the we're best. trying to keep you uh, coming back. Okay, so. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. You didn't tell me you were bringing spiders on board. I didn't, I know. So this, this is a spider crab, and Ooh. another one of our fan favorite invertebrates. And this spider crab, you can see it is fuzzy like Velcro because what it does, it basically carries its own refrigerator on its back. <laughs> uh, and you know, they're opportunistic. So if there's something of live prey that they wanna eat, they're gonna go for it. But if there's no food available, they're gonna start sticking algae and seagrass and all this wonderful fuzzy stuff that you see on its back for when times get tough. Uh, so then they can just reach around and snip, snip, snip. There's Good lunch. camouflage too. Absolutely. And um, do I have to worry about this? crab pinching me like how, no. how how can I tell you know if a crab would be like really uh, aggressive so you can definitely look at its anatomical features and one of them is the claws so look at those little baby pinchers I mean in the scheme of things uh if you've all ever maybe seen a stone crab claw or a blue crab I wouldn't put my fingers anywhere near that but this particular spider crab I think it would have a really hard time doing some damage uh on my fingers there nice. we go so you see, it's I mean, trying they to still work do pinch, but I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And those nice pointed walking legs, this uh, crab can do, uh, can walk front and back, right? I think oh, it moves yeah. around all very, different directions. Very nimble. Uh, it can work its way into but, small nooks and crannies. Cool. But well, we fantastic. Love that was a great mix. So like we said, we only kept the top tier uh, organisms for you to see today. 
but don't fret. If you didn't see something you were hoping for, come back next month. We are positive. We're going to have what you're looking for. So <laughs> awesome. We're going to wrap it up by asking Julie some questions about her work here at the reserve because water quality directly impacts exactly what we find in our trawls all throughout the reserve. So Julie, can you just tell us a little bit about what you do here? All right, let's give it away. Uh, so what I do is I uh, manage our water quality program, which would include our continuous water data uh, sites. We have five of them in our NUR. Um, we also collect nutrient samples at each of those sites. And then we also have um, a location at our Shell Island Road Dock where we collect samples over a 24 hour tidal cycle every two and a half hours. And all of that uh, sampling for the nutrients and the ISCO is done once a month. And then um, our data signs on our sites for the water quality, we use these continuous um, water loggers. They take uh, samples for us every 15 minutes and collect that data and store it in this housing. Um, and uh, we do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 <laughs> days a year at all five sites. So Job security. <laughs> do we have one close by? Yeah, we actually have a site right near us. Um, and see if I can. The cool thing Ooh, about might this be hard. Site, Oh, okay. There. Yeah, we can see it. Oh, okay, okay. So it is in the distance. So it's that marker. Um, yep. And the cool thing about this site is uh, it's got telemetry. So it collects data. It takes it and sends it to a satellite or go NOAA Go satellite, and then that data gets sent to our centralized data management office's website. Um, and so you can get near real-time data it's about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes behind because it's it sends it every hour um and you can get that through our website awesome they just go right right to rookerybay.org maybe uh we can put it in the chat yeah and you can go there's actually a really cool new mobile site it's nurs data n-e-r-r-s data dot org backslash mobile and what I've done is I just took that site and I saved it to my homepage. So anytime I wanna just look at some current data and we've got not only the water quality telemetry site, but we also have a weather telemetry site. So if you're interested in what the wind is doing out on the water before you go boating, you can just pull that up. The only thing you really need to know is when you go into that site, Rookery Bay's code is RKB. So you'll want to look for RKB because each nurse site, each of the 29 nurse has its own code. So you can look at San Francisco if you want to. You can look at Alaska and you can see what oh they're Oh my gosh, doing. that's amazing. Yeah, so it's a really cool option for that's people. Awesome. And for all of our snowbirds, there is a NUR on the Great Lakes. So I know you're going to be comparing water quality data from Southwest Florida <laughs> to Lake Erie. I just know oh, it. I feel great. it in my bones. Awesome. Well, cool. Julie, that is beyond cool. We're so grateful to have you out today, kind of helping us supplement our awesome trawl and giving us a backstory of how important water quality is right here in our estuary. So fantastic. Well, that's it from the field today. So we'll be hanging on to answer questions um, about our trawl. And, and you know, um, hopefully we'll see you all again um, on our next Finding Fish. So back to you all in the back end. Bye, everybody. Oh, uh, can Perfect. you repeat the website really quick? Julie. It's nursdata.org. And then if you want the mobile site, just do a backslash mobile. Perfect. Easy peasy. All right, I'm saying bye too. Woo! Bye everybody. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you guys so much. Safe travels. All right, so here we are back at the map. So where you saw was actually really close to Rookery Bay proper in this area outside of our field station. So next, as we're preparing to answer your questions from the Q&A box, I see some in there. I wanted to show you guys if my slide will advance. Geez, sorry about my technical difficulties today. Here we are. I wanted to tell you that this isn't all. We are doing a series of these excursions. So Morgan mentioned that you'll see us monthly in the field finding fish. So we are offering these every other Friday. So the first Friday of the month is finding fish, just like today, but it won't be just like today because we can find fish in a variety of ways, a variety of places, and there are so many fish to find. So we want you to join us again and again. In between, you can see at this flyer on the left, 
that we have other topics to cover as well that we'll also be featuring different staff and, um, and people associated with Rookery Bay. So we hope that you'll join us every other Friday. You can go to our website, rookerybay.org to sign up. On the right side of your screen, you can see all of our events that we're offering through April, and they include a family camp out. How cool would it be to camp out in Rookery Bay, especially because our environmental learning center is closed. So we received special permission to offer this camp out for families, and we hope that you'll join us in March. We have naturalist guided boat tours. We have photography and binocular classes. We have everything, and we're really proud to share it with you. So I'm going to stop my share and turn it over to Dita to begin the question answering. Take it away. We can't hear you, Dita, you're muted. Push the wrong button, shoot. <laughs> I'm too excited about Q&A. Um, so we do have a variety of questions, which is great field staff. Hopefully you are ready. Um, so our first one does have to do with the water temperature right now. Since it is 75 degrees, is that kind of a regular temperature for this time of year? Is it warmer than normal? Is it a regular temperature for this time of year? Hold on, let me, okay, let's see. Woo, we're coming back. Um, I'm going to say it's probably a little warmer than normal, uh, but we also have, you know, tidal influence um, and the water temperature also varies depending on where in the water column you're located. The bottom of the water is probably warmer than the top of the water, uh, which is why a lot of critters like to, you know, bury down into the mud and, and kind of hide themselves down in the bottom of oyster bars and so forth. Have you seen, um, when anyone's been out in the field, have you seen more manatees or a lot manatees then since the water seems maybe a little warmer than past years or? Um, I, well, let's see. I haven't. I haven't seen any manatee in probably, I don't know, a month. Yeah. So I, I think that they are in tune with um, their natural uh, place they go in the winter yes. uh, for, cause you know, fresh water is missing too. They need fresh water. So that's the other thing. It's not just temperature for manatee. It's uh, where's the fresh water at? Yeah, uh, about a month ago when we had uh, that kind of rain spurt, we were seeing them come up our creek just for about yeah, a week. Yeah, right up the way here. Um, and that's pretty fresh uh, up that way, so. And I can say there's a lot of manatees right now at the manatee park up in Fort Myers. So they've definitely found those little warmer water areas where they're hunkering down for the winter, even if 75 does sound a little warm for this time of year. Um, another one is with those spider crabs. Um, so you'd mentioned they live in estuaries. Can they live anywhere else? And could you ever find them near the beach? So I haven't seen them near the beach. They kind of tend to hang out in a muddy bottom, um, sandy, you know, sandy muddy bottom near, near some structure, maybe near some seagrass. They love seagrass. So uh, I've definitely seen them all year long. Sorry, my camera, I'm like talking, but you can't see me. I've seen them all year long at um, some of our more shallow lagoons. And it, so whether it's, you know, low salinity or high temperature, they seem pretty robust, mm -hmm. those spider crabs. And um, yeah, but definitely they, they do like some structure because they don't have a lot of defense, you know, and they blend in well with that more muddy bottom or like a nice seagrass area. <laughs> but I have, I have never seen one on the beach. No, um, never. Yeah. Um, and then we have a follow-up question on the pipefish. So that pipefish that you had, you had mentioned that it's a male, that it was um, pregnant. So is that about full size for that species? Oh, Dita, you're going to have to help us with that one. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Um, so there is a clue with that since it is reproducing and it does have that brood pouch. That means it is an adult size. So they do only really get about that four or five inches for that, that species of pipefish. Um, other times we don't get them as often, but we do get a chain pipe fish and a Florida pipe fish and they can get maybe up to 14 inches. So they get bigger, but they're not a gigantic fish. What are some other of the more interesting or unique fish that you have caught in your trawls near our dock? Well, I think that you're going to have to tune in to all the next finding fish if you want to see that because we had some pretty cool fish we caught that we said, you know what, we're doing this three more times. Um, 
let's uh, let's get people like uh, thinking and get them excited. And hopefully they'll be coming back to see more because um, we have so many cool odd shaped fish that we actually catch a lot that I bet a lot of you you've probably you've never seen before um, <laughs> because they are at the bottom. And um, yeah, it's just going to be awesome. So we'll give you all the information to keep on coming back for those really cool species that you just wanted to know so much about. <laughs> And then I know um, it looks like we have, well, I know we have these scheduled all through May. Uh, what kind of differences would you see in the water quality um, from this time of year in May, say? Repeat it. Repeat the question. Um, what kind of major difference in the water quality? Um, I know the temperature will be pretty different, but between now with this set today in February versus in May. Okay. Oh, let me uh, switch my camera. <laughs> so um, right now we're in the middle of our dry season. So we're going to have, um, you know, our salinities aren't going to vary as much. Um, the water's cooler, so it holds more oxygen. Um, we've got um, the pH pretty much stays the same all year. If there's more fresh water coming in, um, it, it might go down like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, pH units, uh, which is not a whole big, big difference. Um, you know, your pH units go from one to 14. So it might change from like 7.8 to 7.4 to <laughs> something to that effect. Um, trying to think of what other factors we're, we're looking at. Um, I would say dissolved oxygen, salinity, um, going through all the parameters of my head right now um, are probably and of course temperature is gonna is gonna um, be a lot lower and so for us that means and I can just say for for my program when the temperature um, goes up that just means that our sites get a lot more fouling a lot more things are happy and they're growing and and so um, the saw Ooh. that we use productivity um, which I showed you here um, we usually have a guard right here, a plastic guard, and it just gets covered with like algae and barnacles and tunicates and, and tube worms. And the funny thing about that um, um, toadfish, and I was laughing because Morgan was saying his jaw is a, is a oyster crusher. They can find their way in my, my son too and wreak havoc in my son because we do turbidity, which is how much um, how much um, uh, particles are in the water. It could be silt, it could be organic particles, but if there's a fish in my guard, my, my turbidity is like going crazy. So um, yeah, so that's, that's uh, you know, I like this time of year because we don't have as much fouling. And I was gonna say too, it kind of depends on, um, you know, where we trawl, right? So uh, if we're closer to the mangroves, um, we're in an open bay, how shallow it is. So the tide's gonna change. It's gonna be different every time we do this. So that will be, an, that could be an influence as well. And like Julie was saying, temperature, you know, that's a big cue for a lot of species to maybe start moving in, having their babies. So um, yeah, I hope it, that we'll see some changes definitely, you know, by, um, our last one in May, some some cues that we should pick up on that uh, we'll talk about, so stay tuned. All right, we just have one last question since you referenced uh, babies, Janine, if you don't mind. Um, with the fish that we catch in our nets, are we getting mainly juveniles? Do we get adults in general? Okay, well, um, we do get um, mainly juvenile fish. So yes. why is that, Morgan? So what's really fun is that estuaries are are basically nurseries for so many different animals most of the time it's fish right they're going to come in here have their young and then once they start to grow up and be able to defend themselves find their own food that's when they venture back out maybe into that marine environment uh, where it's a little bit more salty but yeah oh my gosh we're trawling in our estuary here in rookery bay it is like juvenile central and you all saw i mean even the toadfish was pretty small so and those can get to be like like pretty girthy so uh yeah this is definitely a, a beautiful place where these juvenile species can grow up uh and then continue their their lineages i mean it's awesome well thank you all so much for joining us today in the audience in the field and at our home offices for dita and i so it was a pleasure to be able to take you into the 110,000 acres of the rookery bay research reserve 
and we hope that you'll join us for a future program. Um, just two small things I want to mention. Uh, this presentation today is being recorded. So the recording will live on the Friends of Rookery Bay YouTube channel, and the link will be posted on the website where you registered for this program. So if you aren't able to make the next presentation, you can always go back and check out the video. So thank you for joining us today. And lastly, we have so many of these scheduled, we wanna make them as good as we can. So we need your feedback. We have created a survey that will automatically pop up on your screen when you close the window today. And if you could just take a minute or two to tell us where you're located and if you're a student, if you're an adult, how you heard about us and any kind of things we can do to improve or things that you really liked. That will help us in this shift to virtual programming. We of course don't have a timeline on when we'll be back doing in-person programming. So we really value your feedback as participants so that we can make it even better next time. So thanks for joining us today from the entire education and research team at Rookery Bay Research Reserve. We're going to hold up that whelk, that lightning whelk, um, because we want to have a group photo. And this is as groupy as we can be from all of our far distances. OK, so if uh, we want to just give it a little smile here. <laughs> OK, perfect. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>